program, and uh, Dr. Pearson and his associates have, have uh, agreed to have uh, arranged this program this morning, which concerns itself with uh, the physiology and the diseases of skeletal muscle. Dr. Carl Pearson, the professor of medicine, will handle the problem from here on. <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Riggler. A, uh, a discussion of uh, disorders of skeletal muscle uh, is uh, not a complicated one for uh, the various people that work here at UCLA because perhaps by remarkable chance we have a number of persons uh, here already whose primary research and investigative interest as well as clinical interests are in the various disorders of the skeletal musculature. The skeletal musculature of the body comprises the largest tissue mass in the body by bulk as well as by weight in the average human. Yet, the musculature should not be considered a homogeneous mass of tissue, but rather a series of symmetrically positioned units or structures on either side of the body. In all, there are approximately 434 individual muscles. <coughs> Each one differs from its neighbor, at least in function, but as well in its structure, very likely, and in, the, and in its biochemical makeup, and in the relationship to the peripheral and the central nervous systems. These factors and others determine its gross coloration, whether it be red or white, which is more obvious in certain lower species than it is in the human. It accounts for the speeds of its reaction, its ability to endure contraction, and a variety of other uh, factors that will be discussed this morning. Very likely, this variability in the appearance and uh, the biochemical and structural makeup of muscle also has a good deal to do with determining certain disease patterns that involve muscle and about which we will speak to some extent this morning. In most diseases, such as in the dystrophies, selected groups of muscles are involved. One can say easily that is due to a genetic influence, and admittedly it may be because the dystrophies are hereditary, and yet it may be due to a more obvious deficiency in some muscles or some muscle groups, namely the fast muscles versus the slow, versus the slow muscles, or the proximal versus the distal, because of some inherent uh, uh, biochemical or structural deficiency. The task of covering more than superficially the many aspects of muscle structure and function and its diseases are very complex and obviously could not be undertaken this morning. However, we plan to have a little something for everyone in this interdepartmental conference. Since uh, we do have, as I'd mentioned here at UCLA, people that are interested both in, both in the basic and in the clinical aspects of muscle from a variety of approaches. Hence, we will draw upon members of the departments of physiology, pathology, internal medicine, physical medicine, neurology, and pediatrics this morning. In planning this conference, it was decided that we should present certain fundamental facts that are known about muscle that may not be known to all of you, uh, many of you of whom uh, deal with clinical subjects far removed from our topic of interest this morning. In addition, I had felt that it would be worthwhile to present something new or what is new on the horizon uh, in uh, disorders of muscle, whether it be a new approach to the biochemistry of contraction, a new technique for analyzing a disease, uh, or another problem which may possibly shed light uh, on uh, some of the fundamental alterations of muscle uh, either in the normal situation uh, or in the disease state. Aside from mentioning uh, them in overall classification, we will not deal in depth today with the dystrophies and polymyositis that make up the majority or the bulk of the disorders that we see in the muscle clinic. Even so, we will not lack for clinical material. Because of the, um, of the almost 50 disorders of muscle that have been described uh, and clearly defined, Fully 15 of these have been described within the past decade and eight since uh, 1962. Thus, new diseases are being separated off. We're learning more about 
uh, uh, various disorders and can subdivide and no doubt this will carry on further. With the use of uh, refined techniques of biochemistry, electrophysiology, cytochemistry, and ultrastructure, uh, new avenues are being opened for further analysis of the muscle cell both in the normal situation uh, and in the disease state. To begin this conference this morning, we will ask uh, Professor Momarts of the uh, Department of Physiology to, to discuss in general the normal anatomy, biochemistry, and physiology of the muscle cell. Dr. Momarts. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm teaching the functional muscle to the first year class. And I'm really reminded of the experience of my old uh, distinguished friend, Terence Cole. When he started out as an instructor in physiology at Columbia, he was given uh, the physiology of muscle to teach. Because in those days, you gave muscle or lipids, if you were in biochemistry, to the lowest man on the totem pole. <laughs> and Dr. Cole <coughs> told me that as he was beginning to hold forth in his first lecture, uh, after a few minutes, one medical student walked out and he wondered how they expressed muscle, muscle, who had ever died of muscle? <laughs> um, it may be, it may still be true that we are not the nation's skill number one. After all, we can't be all on top. But <laughs> the fact remains, however, that as Dr. Pearson has pointed out, now more than then, a large number of muscle diseases are known, and that these are not at all uh, minor, and that some of these can be very major uh, diseases indeed. So Pearson mentioned 50. Uh, we may well predict uh, that there will be many more before long. Uh, because there are so many things that can go wrong. May I have my slide, please? What I'm giving you here is a <coughs> summary <coughs> of uh, not everything about the function and the metabolism of muscle, but two-thirds. And I will tell you in a moment what the other one-third is. Um, <coughs> the way the slide is organized, you see those vertical columns, which tell you something about what the major structural component is, its composition or its function. And then there are five horizontal rows. Uh, and then there are five horizontal rows. Now let us look at first at the one here right in the middle, uh, which has the function of carrying out contraction itself. And of course, that is the, the real essence of the matter, and in, in a sense, the major reason why muscle is there. But clearly, such a contractile system alone, without being built into the proper environment, uh, could have no assistance. And therefore, <coughs> it would be unwise to say that this is really the most important and the rest really doesn't count. What we have above this uh, line which mentions the machinery are the systems which provide the energy for this contractile function to occur. Because you realize that contractile function and the performance of work uh, does imply internal flow of energy. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it is the major energy uh, using machinery in the body and the fact that it can be switched on and off. Uh, giving a difference in power of about a thousand volts, or several hundred volts anyway, is of course the main variable uh, and the main variable strain upon all of metabolism, all of cardiovascular adjustments, etc. Below, we have the two systems <coughs> that deal with switching the contractile function itself on and off, because it wouldn't do to have uh, the, the muscles contracted all the time. This would be just some functional as to have them not contracted at all, uh, it, the, it makes sense only when this can be switched on and off in a sensible pattern. Well, um, to talk about the energy supply then, we had the cycloplasm, uh, which is, let us say, the fluid plasma outside all the other structural components, which contains soluble enzymes, which are the agents mainly of glycolysis, uh, whereby uh, functional activity can be carried on for a long time without direct oxygen supply. As you know, uh, when, when you run the 100 meter dash, it makes very little difference whether you breathe or not. Anaerobic metabolism can carry you quite a bit, and that is the function of this system. The mitochondria, which will be discussed at length, they are highly structured. Um, they carry out the much more complex and much more efficient um, oxidative generation of energy, and they are, of course, important for those muscles which 
um, function continuously, such as the heart that we are not talking about the heart today. On the other side of the fibrils, we have here a mechanism. Oh, let me start with this one first. The cell membrane, not unlike the one in nerve, has the function of conducting an impulse which enters a muscle fiber at the neuromuscular junction, but which has to spread over the whole side. Its properties are certainly not unlike those of nerve and its function, but which means also that with respect to mechanism, we do not know much about it. But unlike nerve, which has nothing else to do than to conduct this excited state, uh, muscle has to translate this excited state wherever it occurs into a contractile activity of the underlying fibrils. And the function of that we find in the sarcotubular reticulum, uh, of which I believe also uh, pictures will be shown, uh, which con consists of a very interesting tubular system of uh, vesicular structures, uh, parts of which can release calcium upon excitation and sequester it back again when relaxation is supposed to occur, and its function is the on-off control. And all of this then centers upon this system here, which is the machinery itself. It is energized by these things from above. It is switched on and off from these things from below. And this is two thirds of the life of the muscle. What is the remaining third, which is not on the slide? Well, well, this refers to the daily activity or the minute to minute activity. Of course, muscle, like every other tissue, has to grow, has to maintain itself, possibly regenerate or hypertrophize. And uh, therefore, uh, just like in any other tissue, there are cell nuclei, uh, ribosomes, all systems involved in protein synthesis and this regulation, we find that here too. Um, well, in a nutshell, uh, with so many moving parts around, there is a great deal that can go wrong, and hence my prediction that 50 diseases is only the beginning. <coughs> <coughs> With that as an introduction, we're going to hear a little bit from Dr. Ralph Coleman about biopsy techniques and the normal histology of muscle to set the groundwork for discussing some of the diseases that we will handle later on in the morning. Dr. Coleman. Due to recent advances in refinements in cytochemical techniques and histochemistry, the muscle biopsy is now becoming more than ever an increasingly important diagnostic as well as investigative tool. Unfortunately, however, the commonly used muscle biopsy procedure, which I might say is still the accepted procedure throughout the world and one which, uh, as the low man on the totem pole a few years ago, I expounded to the students this is the technique in which the muscle is allowed to die for 20 or 30 minutes after it's removed from the patient and then placed into a fixative. The following material will illustrate that this manner is generally unsatisfactory for providing information other than that which has already been ascertained by clinical methods other than the muscle biopsy. In my own laboratory, we have been relying heavily on rapid freezing and fixation with isometric muscle clamps in order to utilize histochemistry and special staining techniques as both a diagnostic tool and an investigative tool. The results of our more recent studies will be illustrated later by the other speakers. At this time, however, I would like to emphasize the essentiality of histochemical and cytochemical studies for diagnostic purposes. During the past few months, we have had the opportunity to study in detail 14 patients that were selected by the interested clinicians for special diagnostic studies. Of these 14 patients, material at the time of muscle biopsy was also submitted in the routine manner through the surgical pathology department. 12 of these 14 cases were interpreted from the routine material by several competent pathologists as being either normal or equivocally abnormal. Paired material studied by the special techniques which will be described enabled us to make definitive pathological diagnoses in nine of the 14 cases. Five of these had nemaline myopathy, 
Two of these had a myotubular type abnormality, and two of these had mitochondrial abnormalities, which led to our describing a new disease entity. Could I have the first slide, please? This composite illustrates the point that I was making as concerns the essentiality of a proper biopsy technique. One of the patients had muscle taken. This is a photomicrograph of an H&E stained section which was submitted through the regular pathology service. These fibers appear essentially normal. This is a PTH stained slide which also appears unremarkable. Similar materials studied by the special techniques reveal numerous nemaline rods uh, seen in this over-differentiated PTH as well as in this frozen section stained by the Gomery trichome technique. Unfortunately, limited personnel and facilities permit us only to accept a few of these biopsies at the present time. I would like to point out that we do have, in my opinion, an excellent cooperative study group going in as much as the clinicians provide me with a detailed clinical summary, history, laboratory data, and ancillary information prior to the biopsy. This is essential because it enables us to ascertain which studies are most important and enables us to expedite the investigation in rather than doing a massive shotgun approach to the material. Next slide, please. Our biopsies are obtained in the operating room by myself or one of my student research assistants. And for this purpose, we utilize this freezing apparatus, which we constructed for less than $30. Liquid nitrogen is used in the larger canister, or Dura flask, to cool isopentane to a minus 170 degrees centigrade. This is an isometric muscle clamp in which one of the surgeons who are familiar with our techniques procures the muscle specimens in the isometric clamp, and then the muscle specimen is frozen immediately within 30 seconds in the isopentane. Another specimen is also fixed in formal alcohol on the isometric clamp and can be used for all routine stains as well as certain special diagnostic techniques. Next slide, please. This is a close-up of the isometric muscle clamp, which enables one whether they have the refinements for doing enzyme histochemistry or whether or not they use routine fixatives, such as formal alcohol, to procure material, effect rapid fixation, and allows us to make a number of diagnoses which would otherwise be impossible. Some of the enzymes, next slide please, are able to withstand fixation, but most of them are not. This composite illustrates the value of using the isometric muscle clamp even for freezing techniques in which one is investigating the histochemistry. The upper left is a frozen section of muscle tissue cross section stained by the modified Gomery trichrome technique. Muscle protein stains blue and the nuclei, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and other material stain slightly pink as do the mitochondria which are not shown here. This waffle effect is due to the ice, artif ice artifact due to improper or slow freezing. This was rapidly frozen on an isometric clamp. This was also frozen without an isometric clamp. Slowly, once again, we see a tremendous distortion. A paired piece of tissue frozen rapidly on an isometric clamp. All of these stained by the modified Gomery technique. You can see the Z bands and under one's own microscope, you can see the I bands and the other material enabling one to make a number of observations of normal cytological structure as well as abnormalities. Next slide, please. Artifacts in muscle histochemistry are numerous. For years, histochemistry has been under uh, reproach because of the artifacts. A number of these can be avoided. For example, slow freezing, as I illustrated, leads to ice crystal formation, producing vacuolization of the fibers. Diagnoses can be made erroneously on normal material. This can be avoided by freezing rapidly in isopentane. And isopentane acts as an excellent mordant to prevent contraction when the isometric clamp is used. 
Enzymatic activity may change rapidly after a biopsy is removed, and the person who does not use rapid freezing techniques may analyze a biopsy for enzymes and reach some erroneous conclusions. And a review of the literature points out this fallacy. <coughs> phosphorylase A is rapidly converted to phosphorylase B in the type 2 muscle fibers, which we will describe momentarily. Acid phosphatase activity increases with hypoxia or autolysis, and of course you see the problem that you get into with even delayed freezing, much less uh, the obsolete method of allowing the tissue to die for a period of time. And mitochondria swell, change their permeability, and some of the new diseases may be mimicked simply by allowing the tissue to remain unfrozen for approximately five minutes. Contraction of the muscle either before or immediately following immersion in isopentane produces artifacts. The same is true if you immerse it in a fixative. Therefore, all muscle should be obtained with the inexpensive biopsy clamp and frozen or fixed in this manner. <coughs> Next slide, please. To quickly review some of the features of the muscle fibers, skeletal muscle has been long recognized to consist of different types of fibers. By histochemical studies, we're able to divide skeletal muscle fibers into two major groups. Histochemical type 1 and histochemical type 2 fibers. Refined techniques may subdivide these, but we feel at the present time, for our purposes, this is sufficient. Anatomically, the ex extremities, deep muscles, and the axial portions of the superficial muscles contain a predominant type 1 fiber. I might say that in all of these areas, there is a mixture, but one does get a predominant type 1 fiber in the deep muscles of the extremity, whereas type 2 fibers are found primarily in superficial portions. The type 1 fibers are characterized by their slow contraction and tension-sustaining ability, whereas type 2 fibers are rapid, strong contraction, short duration, and utilize glycolysis and glycogen as a source of energy, whereas the type 1 fibers re rely heavily upon oxidative phosphorylation and utilize fatty acids and glucose as metabolites. Next slide, please. Type 1 fibers are further characterized by the fact they're rich in mitochondrial enzymes, cytochrome oxidase, DPNH diaphorase, succinct dehydrogenase, and Krebs cycle enzymes. The type 2 fibers are low in the mitochondrial enzymes. However, the type 2 fibers are rich in the enzymes of glycolysis, phosphorylase, lactic dehydrogenase, whereas the type 1 fibers are low in the enzymes of glycolysis. Type 1 fibers are low in myosin ATPase, and this allows us to screen muscles for this sarcoplasmic location, whereas the type 2 fibers are rich in myosin ATPase. The predominant isozymes of lactic dehydrogenase, which has five isozymes, 1, 2, and 3 are predominant in type 1 fibers, whereas 4 and 5 predominate in the type 2 fibers. Next slide, please. Obviously, one must choose a muscle in the active state of disease rather than one in far advanced disease or, which is, or one which is not involved if you are to obtain adequate information. And at the same time, you should also biopsy a muscle that is known to contain a fairly equal proportion of both histochemical type fibers if you are to evaluate adequately these two different types, both biochemically and histochemically. And one should routinely especially in disease of unknown etiology, biopsy more than one muscle, and not a muscle which has been previously biopsied or needle for electromyography or had other types of trauma. Next slide, please. This is a composite to illustrate the reciprocal staining of the type 1 and type 2 fibers, referred to as the so-called checkerboard pattern. Here we see a section stain with myosin ATPase. Now, I might say that in histo slide histochemical reactions, a dye precipitate is used to localize the site of enzyme activity. In myosin uh, ATPase staining, the end product is cobalt sulfide. And here we see that the type 2 fibers are richest in myosin ATPase. The type 1 fibers are poorest. Perhaps you look here at this area. This is a section of normal gastrocnemius. The type 1 fibers are rich in mitochondrial enzymes. This is succinic dehydrogenase. 
This is DPNH diaphorase. Once again, the type 1 fibers are rich in the mitochondrial enzymes, and the type 1 fibers are poor in phosphorylase. In this section stain for phosphorylase, one can see that the type 2 fibers are richest in phosphorylase, whereas the type 1 fibers are poor. Next slide, please. We do have, and I would like to point this out because some of the biochemists are constantly criticizing uh, the techniques. One can avert many staining artifacts by attention to detail. For example, incubation at the lowest pH consistent with the dehydrogenases being studied will assist with our avoiding the demonstration of nothing dehydrogenase, which is simply a false positive reaction but has been reported in the literature as being a significant reaction before this fact was known. And incubation of the slides with substrate and non-substrate in addition to a number of blocking agents. Sometimes blocking agents may, we may have as many as 15 controls for a series of reactions. This also permits one to avoid artifacts due to staining. Next slide, please. DPNH diaphorase, the key intermediate enzyme, in demonstration of the dehydrogenase is located in the mitochondria. Thus, and erroneously, this is in quotes, one could say that apparently uh, all dehydrogenase activity is located in the mitochondria, but this is not true. Lactic dehydrogenase, for example, a sarcoplasmic enzyme, can be demonstrated by using phenazine methosulfate as an intermediate and thus avoiding another false staining or an artifact. Emphasize that caution must be used in interpreting these, and of course, one can also do paired serial section studies to demonstrate other localizations such as fat versus mitochondria. Next, please. Now, one disadvantage that histochemical techniques lack is that they uh, cannot be quantitated with the precision of biochemical techniques. However, histochemical techniques do have the distinct advantage of being able to use them for accurate localization at the cytological level. And it's thus possible to compare the activities of cell with those of its neighbor and also to correlate chemical reactions with morphological structure, including fine structure. In our own laboratory, we have been able to go one step further in that we have developed techniques for using serial sections of frozen cryostat cut material for alternate qualitative and quantitative purposes. Qualitative reactions, as well as quantitative reactions, can be carried out in this microcell, a plastic cell developed in the research shop, in which incubating media and reaction media is placed in the cell, and a slide with the tissue is placed over the cell, clamped, and the reaction is carried out. Following the techniques of Lowry and relying upon photofluorometry, the determinations and assays can be made for example, in phosphorylase, we assay the triphosphyridine nucleotide in product and then measure the residual protein. Next, please. This simply illustrates that in using this, one can compare a number of diseases always, and utilizing, for example, in this instance, McCarl's disease as a control. Next, please. Serial sections were examined in this particular manner. This illustrates a slide qualitative histochemical reaction for demonstrating phosphorylase A. Here we see A and B. This is control for McCardle's disease. By utilizing the quantitative techniques, we were able to measure normal amount of phosphorylase A and B, 12.6 micrograms. And I might say that this is within the range that one gets biochemically and has the advantage of being able to compare both localized abnormalities as well as structure. In concluding these remarks, I would simply say that the recent advances in histochemistry have enabled us to do that which we thought was perhaps impossible a few years ago, and we feel that continued utilization of these techniques with improvements and utilization of electron histochemistry should enable us to provide both better diagnostic care as well as investigative tools for the clinicians as well as the basic scientists. <coughs> why, don't, why doesn't everyone come and sit down? They will, now that the lights are on. <coughs> I'm
I'm glad to see we're so well populated this morning. Now for an overall view of disorders of muscle, uh, Dr. Munsad is going to talk with us briefly about the classification of diseases of muscle. Dr. Munsad. <coughs> Could I have the uh, first slide up, please? Uh, because the various myopathies include such a wide spectrum of etiologic agents, uh, it has been extremely difficult to construct an all-inclusive scheme of classification. A few authors have attempted to do so, but only by erecting uh, somewhat artificial barriers. Uh, we here at UCLA, uh, diagnostically and for coding purposes, uh, have been using a scheme which includes uh, 10 major uh, categories. And although this is a little uh, less rigid, we feel that it's possibly being uh, a bit more honest within our uh, limits of knowledge at this time. I would therefore like to review very quickly with you the various diagnostic categories and give you sort of an overflight, if you will, of some of the uh, disease entities uh, that we uh, meet with. Uh, could I have the next slide? Uh, by far the most common group of muscle disorders are the dystrophic myopathies or muscular dystrophies, and of these, the classical Duchenne or pseudohypertrophic uh, variety is the one that we see uh, most frequently. This is the uh, sex-linked recessive variety that manifests mainly in males and is carried by the female. Uh, it can be uh, diagnosed successfully by the use of serum enzymes both in the preclinical patient uh, as well as the carrier mother. The other forms of muscular dystrophy are uh, less severe in manifestation. Uh, they are restricted uh, in bodily distribution, for example, the ocular type, which is limited to the eye muscles, the fascio-scapulohumeral type, which is rather limited to those muscles uh, indicated by its descriptive title. Next slide, please. Under the term myotonic syndrome, we group a, uh, uh, a number of uh, muscle disorders which are characterized by the phenomenon of myotonia, uh, which refers to a prolonged relaxation uh, of a muscle that has contracted either voluntarily or by uh, percussion. The prototype disorder here is myotonic muscular dystrophy or dystrophia myotonica, which consists of progressive muscle wasting with myotonia, but in addition, a number of dystrophic features in other organ systems, such as cataracts, uh, early lenticular cataracts, frontal balding, testicular atrophy, and possibly some other endocrine dysfunction. Under pseudomyotonia, we list those disorders which display electrical myotonia by EMG, but very rarely do they show clinical myotonia, although in some circumstances uh, this is not entirely uh, true. Next slide, please. The inflammatory myopathies have been discussed here at various conferences, especially the second major category, the polymyositis syndrome. Uh, that inflammatory disorder of muscle, which is probably related to the uh, collagen vascular diseases uh, and may appear with various manifestations of other uh, collagen vascular disorders. And next slide. The periodic paralyses are an interesting group of disorders. These may be primary or essential or may be secondary to dysfunction of thyroid gland associated with renal disease, either potassium retention or loss, and are characterized by essentially a normal uh, status, uh, which is then interrupted by periodic attacks of weakness, and these are usually, but not always, associated with alterations in the serum potassium, and sometimes possibly with intracellular potassium as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, we now know that those uh, muscle disorders characterized by myoglobinuria are not uh, a disease uh, entity uh, unto themselves, but rather that myoglobinuria is a symptom common to many muscle disorders and merely reflects the situation where muscle cells are being broken down rapidly, uh, diffusely to the point where the serum and then the urine uh, myoglobin reaches the peak that it's uh, clinically uh, detectable. So that uh, this is not a disease but can occur with McArdle's uh, disease, for example, in certain patients with acute alcoholism, with acute mo uh, polymyositis, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, the endocrine myopathies are known to most of you. The most common one here is hyperthyroid myopathy, but myopathies have been reported in association with hyper and hypofunction of just about every uh, endocrine gland. Uh, we know of. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the congenital myopathies will be discussed in more detail in just a few minutes. Uh, they're listed here. Uh, next slide. Uh, also of recent interest has been a group of uh, myopathies characterized by various possible defects uh, in uh, enzymes involved in glycolytic metabolism. 
Uh, the prototype here is McArdle's disease, which is characterized by congen congenital absence of muscle phosphorylase. But recently, other disorders have been described with these various enzymes being either deficient or not functioning normally. And this list is being added to almost a weekly. Next slide, please. Uh, a group of, quote, toxic, I don't know if that is really a proper term, but myopathies which are associated with exogenous uh, uh, substances, uh, sometimes iatrogenic, steroid myopathy, chloroquine myopathy, and so on, some deficiency state myopathy. There, there are others that are listed here. Uh, next slide. <coughs> and, of course, our old friend, the miscellaneous category, which contains those disorders that uh, right now uh, we're not too sure where they belong. Thank you, Dr. Monsat. As you can see, the, uh, the list is growing long and complicated, and obviously we will have uh, no time to discuss more than a few of these uh, disorders in uh, very slight detail this morning. But perhaps some other conference later on could deal specifically with the dystrophies or some other uh, more particular topic such as that. Uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, it's worthwhile to assess the various other tools, aside from histochemistry and, uh, and pathology, that one utilizes in making a diagnosis of a disease of muscle. Firstly, one must have a, a clinical understanding of the case, and whether it's involving proximal or distal muscles and the like. Nextly, one must uh, uh, evaluate the strength of the individual and the techniques whereby evaluating strength are going to be presented to us as well as other laboratory diagnostic procedures that are of value in assessing diseases of muscle and these will give, be given by Dr. William Fowler of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Fowler. <coughs> Although weakness is the predominant uh, finding in most disorders of the muscular system, uh, it may also result from disturbances in the cortical spinal pathways, uh, the lower motor neuron, including the anterior horn cell and its peripheral nerve, and the myoneural junction. Uh, while information from laboratory tests is valuable, the diagnosis of most neuromuscular diseases can be made on the basis of a detailed clinical history and physical examination. Can I have the first slide, please? <coughs> The most important thing in the uh, history is a family survey. Uh, is this uh, uh, pattern uh, sex-linked recessive, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive? Uh, one should not stop just at investigating whether or not there was a neurologic disease in the family, but go into it in more detail. Uh, whether there are any members of the family that had cataracts, frontal baldness, uh, or any type of dermal uh, lesions. Uh, the age of onset, and the rate and mode of progression and the distribution of weakness and the clinical assessment as well as the uh, history uh, should be investigated with considerable uh, vigor. Uh, is this uh, primarily a proximal or a distal muscle disease? Uh, did it start in childhood uh, or uh, was the infant uh, born with this or did it start in uh, adulthood? Uh, one, uh, in effect, must uh, sort of trick the patient. You just can't uh, ask the patient whether or not he or she had weakness. Uh, the individual with involvement of the eye muscles will very often complain uh, that she gets soap in her eyes when shampooing her hair. The patient with facial scapular humeral dystrophy, uh, the first complaint is often that she is unable to put lipstick on or comb her hair. On the other hand, the person with distal weakness uh, will complain that she is unable to open a jar of mayonnaise or turn the doorknob. Uh, as far as the uh, distribution of weakness is concerned, uh, you're dealing with two things. One, simple observation of the patient in a variety of uh, positions, and uh, number two, uh, specific uh, evaluation of uh, individual and groups of muscles. Uh, does the, is the patient able to stand on the toes? Is the patient able to do deep knee bends? Uh, can the patient walk backwards? A detailed muscle examination is necessary since many of the patients with uh, slowly progressive neuromuscular diseases uh, substitute normal muscles for abnormal muscles uh, so that the resulting activity pattern uh, is often quite normal to the unaided eye. <coughs> uh, 
the examination of weakness in children is especially difficult and is based uh, primarily upon simple observation. Uh, during the first few weeks of life, the so-called primitive or attitudinal reflexes can be used. Uh, for example, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex uh, can be used to evaluate strength of the elbow flexors and extensors and the hip flexors and extensors. The Landau reflex can be used to evaluate the uh, strength of the uh, neck, uh, trunk, and hip uh, muscles. Uh, if one lifts an infant under the armpits, the normal tendency of the infant is to press down so that you're not only able to lift the infant up, uh, but you lift up the high chair with the infant. Uh, the uh, young child uh, with weakness of the shoulder girdle muscles will literally slip through your hands like a piece of spaghetti. The associated uh, findings, uh, tenderness, contractures, myotonia, hypertrophy, uh, things of this nature are extremely important to elicit both from the history uh, and from the physical examination. Uh, on many occasions these associated or ancillary findings uh, can make the diagnosis for you. <coughs> Uh, the general laboratory survey should include uh, uh, tests with reference to thyroid uh, dysfunction, adrenal cortical uh, dysfunction, serum potassium abnormalities, and the response of the weakness to tensilon. The major diagnostically useful laboratory tests are the electromyogram and nerve conduction, the uh, serum enzymes, and the biopsy. Uh, I would point out that uh, in both the serum enzymes and the electromyogram, they do not make a diagnosis, an etiologic diagnosis. Indeed, probably the electromyogram is one of the most abused uh, and misunderstood tests in our laboratory armamentarium. Uh, the serum enzymes are valuable as long as one realizes that they merely reflect, reflect a efflux uh, from uh, diseased or damaged muscle tissue. Uh, for that reason, uh, creatine phosphokinase is the most valuable and sensitive enzyme since it is found predominantly uh, in uh, skeletal and heart muscle. Uh, in the cortical involvement of the cortical spinal tracts, involvement of the uh, uh, lower motor neuron, involvement of the myoneural junction, the serum enzymes are within normal limits. Uh, creatine phosphokinase, among other enzymes, is elevated in the rapidly progressive uh, muscle diseases so that one finds an elevation of uh, creatine phosphokinase in the early Duchenne pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy, but may very well find a normal or near normal level in the very slowly progressive uh, facial scapula humeral dystrophy. Uh, creatine phosphokinase <coughs> is also elevated in the uh, polymyositis and dermatomyositis when it is acute and florid. Uh, although on many occasions the transaminases and aldolase uh, may be elevated proportionally greater than creatine phosphokinase. As far as the EMG and uh, nerve conduction go, uh, again, here one is looking for an anatomical location. Uh, in involvement of the cortical spinal tracts, uh, involvement of the myoneural junction, the electromyogram and the nerve conduction, conduction are uh, essentially normal. If there is involvement of the anterior horn cell or its peripheral nerve, uh, one looks for uh, denervation manifested by fibrillation potential, sharp waves, and occasionally fasciculation. One cannot differentiate between involvement of the anterior horn cell or the peripheral nerve with the electromyogram. For this, one depends on the motor nerve conduction. In involvement of the peripheral nerve, the nerve conduction will be slowed. Uh, example, this is poliomyelitis versus uh, Guillain-Barre or infectious neuronitis, the latter having marked slowing of uh, motor nerve velocity. In uh, myopathies, uh, one depends almost completely upon uh, the motor units on volitional activity. Uh, in this case, they're usually reduced in uh, duration and in amplitude. Uh, one should not forget, however, that contrary to most of the literature, one finds denervation in many of the myopathies, so that one sees fibrillation in patients with various types of muscle diseases, including muscular dystrophy. Could I have the next slide, please? At all times, uh, one must try to categorize uh, his findings by the various anatomical areas into which they fall. Uh, involvement of the cortical spinal pathways, uh, one finds in addition to the weakness, 
uh, the hyperactive stretch reflexes or pathological abnormal reflexes. Uh, there's on occasion, of course, uh, increased resistance to passive motion. Uh, atrophy is rare uh, in uh, involvement of the cortical spinal pathways. Now, an exception to this is in uh, children with the so-called hypotonias, uh, where one may find decreased reflexes, uh, no pathological reflexes, but complete floppy infant. Uh, examples of this, of course, are the atonic diplegia, uh, congenital uh, cerebellar ataxia, things of this nature. In involvement of the lower motor neuron, uh, one looks for fasciculation if the anterior horn cell is involved. Uh, one has absent reflexes or hypoactive reflexes. However, usually in involvement of the lower motor neuron, uh, there is uh, a distal or generalized distribution of the weakness. There are some exceptions to this, uh, but uh, they are rare. Uh, in the involvement of the peripheral nerve, one has the same type of findings as he does in the anterior horn cell, but in addition, uh, has uh, sensory changes, either subjective or objective. Uh, at the myoneural junction, there's really only one disease of significance, and that is myasthenia gravis, uh, where the extraocular muscles are usually involved. They have a very variable course, uh, fluctuating course, with strength increases following rest and fatigue uh, easily following contraction. In involvement of the muscle fiber, uh, there is usually a paroxysmal distribution. Again, there are exceptions. For example, myotonic dystrophy will have a distal distribution. Gower's dystrophy, distal dystrophy, is, as the name implies, distal. Inevitably, one is faced with the possibility that the patient has psychogenic disturbance uh, and not organic weakness. Uh, on many occasions, this weakness is characterized by specific positive findings, and it is not necessary to rule out uh, organic disease by a multitude of tests. Uh, the first thing one notices on examining the patient on manual muscle tests is a cogwheel response. The patient gives, lets go, gives, lets go when res resistance is applied. You and I, uh, when we have a resistance applied, uh, have a certain breaking point, and then it breaks at that point. These people do not. There's marked inconsistencies. When you do a manual muscle test on the table, uh, their hip flexors, extensors, knee flexors, and extensors are barely anti-gravity. Yet you stand them up and they can do deep knee bends without any difficulty. Uh, this is also manifested by slowness of motion. Most of you who have done any exercises know that it is much more difficult, takes much more energy to do the maneuver slowly. Yet these people will do knee, deep knee bends, stand up on their toes very slowly, deliberately, and do it for hours on end. Uh, there's also an overflow of activity so that when they walk, there's an overflow into inappropriate areas. <coughs> I think then in uh, summary that the clinical evaluation includes a thorough family survey, detailed information concerning the rate, mode of progression, and distribution of weakness, and the age at the time of onset. Associated findings such as myotonia, tenderness, dermal lesions, and so forth should also be noted. The major diagnostically useful laboratory tests are the EMG, the nerve conduction, the serum enzymes, and the muscle biopsy. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Fowler. In order to focus down on two or three uh, diseases and discuss them a little bit more in detail, I thought we would discuss some of the relatively new myopathies that have been described, as uh, I commented on before, within the past decade or within the past four or five years. It has been possible, utilizing the newer tools of uh, cytochemistry and uh, electron microscopy especially, uh, to uh, define and learn a little more about some of these disorders and uh, therefore in turn possibly uh, allow us to learn a little more about the normal activity and function and structure as well as uh, uh, biochemical organ or electrical and biochemical organization of muscle. Here at UCLA, we have a fairly sizable muscle diseases clinic. We uh, draw, obviously, from a large area. There are small ancillary <coughs> clinics in the surrounding area, but for research purposes and diagnostic purposes, I should say that we see uh, nearly all of the people in the Southern California area that have 
a disorder that is an actual organic weakness or may be a weakness, and we have to use Dr. Fowler's techniques to define uh, sometimes whether weakness truly exists. Uh, I would say, uh, and would have to consult Dr. Munsat on this, that probably our patient population of disorders of muscle numbers about 1,000 or thereabouts, patients and families that we have seen and uh, attempted to assess the disorders of muscle. Uh, and just roughly last night, excluding myasthenia gravis, the clinic of which is run by uh, Dr. Herman of the Division of Neurology, uh, I would uh, guess that um, our uh, patient population falls into the following percentage categories. Namely, if we, uh, um, the majority of the patients obviously that we see in this clinic are the dystrophies because they are the most common disease and one up about which we're not dealing today. And yet, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the childhood sex-linked variety, would make up about 40% of all patients that we see. Other types of dystrophy without myotonia would probably make up another 10%, and myotonic dystrophy and other forms of myotonia would make up uh, another 5%. Polymyositis uh, is a common disorder, especially in the adult, and therefore would make up about 20% of our patient population. Various types of neuromuscular disease disease involving the spinal cord, but excluding the localized peripheral neuropathies, would make up 15%, with 5% being uh, of adult age onset, the uh, 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 motor system diseases, the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and the like, whereas another 10% would consist of the infantile or childhood onset neuromuscular diseases. 5%, and the interesting 5% that we will talk about uh, in the next remaining few minutes of this conference will be the non-progressive myopathies that are now being split off into various other uh, sub-disease entities and a remainder of a miscellaneous category uh, would uh, make up the uh, other 5% of our clinic population. And I would think that talking with people around the country or around the world that this is a reasonably uh, a general impression of others that uh, run muscle disorder clinics uh, elsewhere too. <clears throat> the disorder that I'm going to talk about very briefly this morning is a disease called nemaline or rod myopathy. <clears throat> uh, this is a disorder that was first described by Dr. Shai and his associates in 1963 as a non-progressive disease uh, revealing a generalized muscular weakness in children or occasionally in adults. There are, in the literature, reported approximately eight cases of nemaline myopathy, and we will get to describing some of the details because they do show uh, certain very interesting uh, uh, structural alterations in the muscle. Here at UCLA, we've had an opportunity to see five patients with this disorder called nemaline myopathy. The first slide will demonstrate uh, a, a, a photograph of a young girl. This photograph was taken when uh, this little girl was five years of age. She had been coming to our clinic for about a year prior to this. Her muscle biopsy, as related by Dr. Coleman on the routine H&E sections, uh, was entirely within normal limits. She had had a slow development of milestones. She had uh, attempted to stand late walked late at approximately the second year and had a diffuse, generalized, moderate degree of weakness, including some facial weakness. Uh, she had also uh, had always difficulty in arising from the floor. She'd had difficulty in placing her arms over her head or in doing any other activity. Namely, she had about a 50% generalized, diffuse loss of muscular strength. She also had a decrease in muscle bulk, as one can see, because she is a rather thin child. She can abduct her arms to the horizontal and even over her head, uh, but with some effort. The next slide will show her three years, uh, will show her at the same time, disclosing some uh, hypermobility of some of her joints uh, and uh, the ability to perform some uh, uh, contortions and acts that uh, uh, many normal children would not be able to do. This is again at the age of five. And the next slide 
the age of eight, discloses the fact that she has had a relatively uniformly maintained degree of strength, or, or uh, lack of strength, if you will, during these years. Her photograph, again, at the age of eight, demonstrates the thinness of the body muscles uniformly shown throughout. She had none of the abnormal cramping or other unusual movements that Dr. Fowler talked about. She did not have myotonia to percussion or any other alteration, merely a generalized inability to do certain activities because her muscles were too weak to actually perform them. The next slide demonstrates a photograph showing the rather awkwardness uh, that uh, uh, this girl uh, demonstrated when she was attempting to arise from the floor, showing the effort that she has to put into her actions and the contortions in order to arise from uh, the sitting or the squatting type of position. The next slide. This demonstrates that we not only had this young lady to deal with, but also a sizable family in which she had six siblings, and two of these on careful examination uh, did demonstrate also a similar degree of weakness. Therefore, it would appear that there is some type of congenital or hereditary disorder present in this family, and our little subject is directly uh, uh, in front of her father. Her father and her mother have been entirely normal in their strength by our testings, as well as by other procedures that we have utilized. Uh, originally, and during the first two or three years of after seeing uh, uh, this child and the family, we didn't really know what she had because all of the laboratory tests were essentially within normal limits. The serum enzymes were normal, the other tools that we utilize uh, for assessment of a disorder of muscle were normal, and as I related, the muscle biopsy was likewise normal uh, uh, to the routine light microscopy. However, the electromyogram was very slightly abnormal in a, quotes, myopathic, unquotes, fashion. Uh, and uh, it did seem that we had some type of very subtle disorder of muscle that was escaping us uh, during the first few years that we had seen uh, this small child. And in addition, we had felt that there were at least two other family members who demonstrated a similar disorder, at least by our clinical examination. The next slides. Uh, demonstrate one member of another family of two sisters, not twins, who have had a generalized weakness of somewhat greater degree than that shown by the first child. Uh, this uh, a girl can hardly get out of the wheelchair. Obviously, we did not know at the time that they had the same disorder, namely nemaline myopathy, but I show you her photograph merely to uh, demonstrate to you that uh, uh, she is one of our clinic patients and that uh, she does have this same disorder. The next slide. Uh, under the phase microscope, by very careful examination, one can see within the muscle fibers, as pointed out by the arrows, several small little rod-like bodies. These are not very prominent and uh, with the routine hematoxyl and eosin stain, they could be easily overlooked. The next slide will demonstrate uh, that uh, here in one of Dr. Coleman's slides, one can see that by his histochemical techniques, there is some difference uh, in the muscle biopsy. Uh, as Dr. Coleman pointed out originally, uh, or, er or earlier this morning, the usual muscle stains with the uh, myosin ATPA stain or with the oxidative stains uh, for DPNH in a checkerboard pattern such as this seen here with dark and light staining fibers. However, the biopsies from our patients demonstrated a uniformity of type uh, in the majority of the muscles. Therefore, there is a suggestion uh, that there is some difference by this histochemical procedure alone. The next slide. When more refined uh, uh, techniques for illustrating uh, the nemaline rods that Dr. Shai first pointed out in 1963 were applied, namely this is the gomery technique. These are muscle nuclei here, and one can see the collections of rods in these several muscle fibers. They stain differently than, do, than does the surrounding sarcoplasm uh, and other elements. The next slide. 
in cross-section in the gomery stain, one can also see uh, that these collections of little bodies staining somewhat different uh, than the surrounding sarcoplasm and its constituents uh, may be seen in many muscle fibers in the biopsies from all of these five children that we have eventually concluded have this unusual disorder. The next slide. From the uh, electron microscopic point of view, Dr. Harold Price, who originally worked here at UCLA and now is at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, has, has undertaken to study the material from some of these cases and has shown some very interesting uh, uh, and has revealed some very interesting features. The unit of the muscle contractile uh, of the of muscle contraction uh, is the sarcomere, which is a unit comprised between one Z band and another. This is one cross striation uh, in the electron uh, microscopic um, uh, uh, blow up, and one can see that. The Z band has this very dark staining material contained within it. And uh, one can see also that uh, contiguous with the Z band and of a similar uh, density are collections of material which appear to be projections of the Z band itself. The next slide will demonstrate also this perhaps in a in a bit more refined fashion. If this is a Z band, one can see that directly continuous with it is a collection of material that has the same staining properties and the same light density uh, as the original uh, Z band material. And the same can be demonstrated up here. This is apparently what the rods uh, that are found in this new entity are comprised of. The next slide. A further example of this is demonstrated here, showing the rather uh, uh, crystalline cross-hatched pattern of the Z-band itself, and a section of a rod here shown at this point, as well as this point, in a blown up fashion. Uh, may I have the lights, please? Well, this is just one very brief example of a new disorder of muscle, a disorder of muscle that may be made up of some of the contractile proteins. There are a number of contractile proteins in muscle besides the actin and myosin that Dr. Momartz talked about. Nowadays, we also learn of a variety of other contractile proteins or uh, substructures uh, uh, of the uh, contractile process, including such compounds as tropomyosin and two substances called act alpha actinin and beta actinin. And uh, it is possible that this disease that we have now uh, had an opportunity to study in some detail is a storage disease of one of these unusual contractile proteins, probably not myosin or actin, but probably one of the others. Uh, how this actually fits in with the production of weakness or the inability to allow muscle to contract fully and completely is still not clear. And yet we do have a disorder in which we have structural alterations, in which we have histochemical techniques for diagnosing it, and in which we can demonstrate clinical weakness. So this is one of the frontiers of the investigation of disease, <coughs> diseases of muscle uh, that has been going on, and in which, although we see few examples of, nevertheless, they can easily provide us with lessons about some of the normal structure of muscle. Uh, Dr. Peter of the Department of Medicine is now going to talk to us a little about another uh, series of interesting disorders, uh, namely those affecting the mitochondria, disorders that we and others have also seen in our clinic and studied in some of these patients, Dr. Peter. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Pearson. May I have the first slide, please? Uh, this is my schematized conception of what electron microscopists are saying these days about myofibrils. And you'll notice here all of the major components that Professor Momertz mentioned, particularly the contractile, so-called contractile proteins themselves, the thick bands, the myosin, the thin bands, that is the actin, their hexagonal arrays. You can see how people have have dreamt up the idea that these may slide together and give rise to a shortening of muscle. 
We now know that along each myofibril, and I should say that many, many of these myofibrils go to make up a single muscle fiber. Along each one of these, there are several systems of tubules, the longitudinal system <coughs> and the transverse system, which en encompasses the myofibril. These are undoubtedly very important in the uptake and release of calcium into the myofibril, which somehow uh, gives rise to a to the sliding of these filaments and hence the shortening of the muscles. But what I'd like to tell you about is the, are the structures that would allow you to run further than 100 yards. Dr. Momertz is satisfied with 100 yards under the influence of cyanide, but these, if we wanted to chop wood all day, we'd be much better off with mitochondria and oxygen. <coughs> and you'll see that these have an interesting distribution. They're right by the eye bed. And it's alongside the I-bands that you see the T-system. That is this system here, which probably is involved in conducting the electrical impulse into muscle and somehow is involved in the release of calcium into muscle to cause it to contract and the uptake to cause it to relax. These are all energy requiring processes. And if mitochondria have to be any place, they might as well be where the energy is needed. And this is where we find them in muscle along the eye bands. Next slide, please. Just how do the mitochondria give one this energy? Well, they're, they're just primarily geared to the formation of energy in the uh, form of ATP, from fatty acid oxidation, the Krebs tricarboxylic acid cycle, and most efficient of all, oxidative phosphorylation. They also have other what we would now call accessory functions, but which I'm sure in years to come we'll learn a great deal more about, particularly this one, intracellular buffering. Next slide, please. This is another sketch of what uh, electron microscopists might think mitochondria look like now. They seem to be composed of at least two membranes, an outer and an inner membrane. And electron microscopists can argue for days as to whether there's a space between these outer and these inner membranes, and I don't think the evidence is all in yet. But suffice it to say that the disease I'll tell you about today gives some evidence that indeed there might be a real space in between this outer and inner membrane. Inside the matrix, these are the invaginated inner membranes to form what they've called the Christe mitochondrialis, and soluble inside this are probably the enzymes of the Krebs cycle, certain transaminases, creatine phosphokinase, and in the outer membranes are probably, among other things, the enzymes of fatty acid oxidation. And this will be important as we see this patient today. Next slide, please. These are some of the mitochondrial abnormalities that have been noted in skeletal muscle, either associated with disease of skeletal muscle per se, or with diseases which reflect themselves in skeletal muscle. The classic one, and the only one that we really have any understanding of, that is a biochemical understanding, and I guess that's the only sort of understanding, is the hypermetabolism due to deficient respiratory control that was uh, described by the people from Sweden a number of years ago, which could be the subject of a conference itself. Then there are the other abnormalities with large, that is megaconial myopathies, large mitochondria, the pleoclonial myopathies, which are sometimes to seem somewhat akin to the periodic paralyses or associated with large numbers of uh, peculiar mitochondria, the mitochondria which you can induce <coughs> in hyper or hypothyroidism, certain cases of myotonic dystrophy, the periodic paralysis, paralysis, and a whole variety of things that you can induce in the experimental pathology laboratory. Next slide, please. This is a 20-year-old UCLA student who started getting easy fatigability when he was eight years old. His fatigue was proportional to the amount of exertion that he did. It would take him longer to rest up after he had severely exerted himself than when he had exerted himself to a lesser extent. He never had myoglobinuria or any other form of pigmenturia. He never had muscle cramping. Indeed, the only thing that could be found abnormal on his physical examination, with the exception of this shortened right upper extremity, which is due to a congenital brachial plexus palsy and is unrelated here, was some 
mild proximal muscle weakness. There were no sensory abnormalities. The EMG, as is typically the case, uh, was uh, showed some, uh, some evidence of myopathic features. Um, as you can expect, a, a horrendous laboratory evaluation was undertaken with the usual negative results, and uh, thus we were left uh, with the more modern approach of histochemistry, electron microscopy, and biochemistry. Next slide, please. I should mention that one test in this patient was abnormal, and this was that he could not produce the normal amount of lactate when he was exercising his forearm under the influence of, a, of ischemia with a blood pressure cuff inflated above systolic pressure and then doing exercise and sampling the lactate after release of the pressure cuff, he was not producing the normal amount of lactate. This is something that has to be explained if we're going to explain what the metabolic abnormality in this patient is. The routine H&E, a little evidence of fiber degeneration, nothing very exciting. I, oil red O stain gives evidence in Dr. Ralph Coleman's hands of at least three different types of fibers, one of which is very abnormal. The very prominent red dots, probably indicating the presence of neutral lipids, are present predominantly in one fiber type, then there's another fiber type where these are less prominent and still a third fiber type where they aren't present at all. This is definitely abnormal. There's too much lipid there. Obviously, it remains for the biochemist to determine what sort of lipid this is and just how much of it there is, but this is good evidence that these are abnormal. Likewise, on stains for mitochondrial enzymes, there is good evidence, again in Dr. Coleman's hands, of a hyperactivity of certain mitochondrial enzymes. And in this case, DPNH diaphorase, which is located in mitochondria, and cytochrome oxidase, which is located in mitochondria. Next slide, please. So that there are in certain muscle fiber types, that is in type 1, 30 or 40 percent of the type 1 fibers in this patient have increased activities of mitochondrial enzymes, and they have increased accumulations of what seems to be neutral lipids. What does the electron microscopy show? This is from a type 2 fiber, and the mitochondria look fairly normal. This is from a type 1 fiber. We have this hook-shaped mitochondria with these most peculiar quadrilaminar, four-layered structures inside there. And if you look at the inset down here, which is about 76,000 diameters, you get the impression that outside of this, these four layers, there's another single membrane, as if the invagination of the inner membrane were covering this four-layered structure, so that this would be, in a sense, inside the cristae. Next slide. Here we see the accumulations under the electron microscope at about 26,000 diameters of uh, what was neutral lipid before it was dissolved out. And then you see these the most peculiar looking mitochondria, almost looking like runways on an airstrip. Next slide. And here, I think you can definitely make out the inner membrane here, the outer membrane here, with the turn here, and then the four layered structure in between the outer and the inner membrane. Here's good evidence that there might indeed be a space between these two membranes. And again, it's evidence that was given to us by a, a freak experiment of nature, if you will. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the same thing in a bit higher magnification. And here we have the two distributions of these four-layered structure, either structures either in the outer mitochondrial space, that is here, are in the intracrystal space, these projections being the cristae, and here another one of them being present. Now how can we tie this all together? We have a patient who can't produce lactate, who's accumulated neutral lipids in his skeletal muscle fibers, and who has an abnormality probably associated with the outer mitochondrial membrane, which we think does fatty acid oxidation. Perhaps, and this is only one among a myriad of possibilities, what has happened here 
is that this patient has a defect of fatty acid oxidation. Neutral lipids accumulate, fatty acids also accumulate. Fatty acids have been known to feed back and repress certain glycolytic enzymes, particularly in liver. This has not been demonstrated in skeletal muscle as yet. But if this were the case, then you could explain why the patient would not produce lactate with exercise, because if you can't produce DPNH, you can't reduce pyruvate to lactate. And this is one possible biochemical explanation, which can be uh, tested in the laboratory in skeletal muscle from this particular patient. Thank you. There's another, and the last disorder that we're going to discuss this morning is another very interesting disease affecting a young child. And Dr. Munsat is going to tell us about myotubular myopathy. Over the years, various authors at different times have postulated that certain congenital neuromuscular disorders uh, may be due to an arrest of normal uh, embryologic development. Uh, for example, infantile spinal muscular atrophy, or wernick hoffmans disease, which is a disease that presents with uh, fibrillations and fasciculations and lower motor neuron uh, disorder, uh, has been thought by some to be due to a failure of the normal outsprouting of nerves to hook up with the muscle fibers so that in the postnatal life the patient is left with essentially denervated uh, muscle fibers. Uh, recently another uh, entity is being described uh, uh, which presents with uh, neonatal congenital weakness which is uh, slowly progressive that may represent an arrest of embryologic development of the muscle fibers so that the muscle fibers cease developing at a stage comparable to 10 weeks of uh, intrauterine life. Uh, at, six, at six weeks of age, the uh, muscle fiber is represented by an elongated, rather nondescript cell, which is multinucleated. There's some controversy over how this uh, multinucleation occurs. The preponderance of evidence at the present time uh, favors the fusion of uh, cells with single nuclei rather than amitotic division. There is a six to seven weeks, some fine material just under the sarcolemmal membrane. Uh, at 10 weeks of age, and this fiber is even longer, there are even more nuclei, and these nuclei are arranged in uh, the center of the fiber, and the myofibrillar development has begun and has taken place, and these myofibrils, which are cross-dried in 10 weeks, are arranged in a peripheral manner. So if we uh, cut across a fiber in transverse section, 10 weeks of age, you see a dark nucleus in the center and myofibrils displayed around the outside like a donut. At 15 weeks of uh, fetal life, the fiber achieves its uh, adult configuration. The nuclei are now a darker, smaller sausage shape. They've migrated to the normal subsarcolemmal uh, position. And the only change that takes place between 15 weeks uh, and uh, six months of a postnatal life is an enlargement of the fiber. In other words, at 15 weeks, the general adult configuration is there. Uh, certain features of this myopathy that I'm going to discuss now suggest that the muscle fibers in this patient who is now age six are comparable with certain reservations to 10 weeks of fetal life, the so-called myotubular stage because of the tubular shape of the muscle fiber and thus the term a myotubular myopathy. Can I have the first slide, please? Uh, could I have the first slide, please? Charlotte Potts, uh, the patient we have studied in some detail. Hello? Could I have the first slide, please? Uh, here we go. Charlotte Potts, who's now six, and we studied in some detail, is the only living child of this family. And here you see the family uh, genealogy outlined uh, here. Here is the propositus. Uh, she had a sibling, uh, a spontaneous abortion at, at five months. We uh, know very little about that pregnancy. And she has, as you see here, a normal four-year-old half-brother. We have uh, displayed Charlotte's mother as a uh, heterozygote because on biopsy, she shows a certain percentage of muscle fibers that are abnormal and similar to the patient herself. Next slide. Now, the patient here at, at four months of age was born of an extremely difficult delivery. She was a cyanotic, flaccid, weak at birth. She had considerable respiratory distress requiring assistance of her respirations, and it was thought indeed that she wouldn't survive. 
uh, but she did survive and at four months of age here you can see she on the surface looks as a normal healthy rotund uh, four month old uh, but uh, nonetheless she still was quite weak as she's uh, continued to be uh, weak up to the present time in a diffuse uh, manner she began to develop seizures at this time which were akinetic as well as focal and generalized uh, major motor uh, seizures next slide uh, could you sharpen that a little bit uh, here she is uh, at 10 months of age her milestones are still delayed she can crawl but she's diffusely weak and uh, if you stretch your imagination a little bit, you might be able to see that she's beginning to show on this family picture here a little ptosis uh, here on the left side, which is not as prominent on the right. Next slide. At two and a half years of age, uh, she is beginning to show even more weakness. She has a classical myopathic facies with an open jaw, a drooping of the eyelids, and expressionless uh, facies, and uh, has difficulty arising from a sitting position. Next slide. Uh, here she is recently, uh, a few months ago, with her normal uh, half-brother, Tim. Her, her limbs are thin. She has some talpes equinovirus deformity of this uh, foot. She's had a muscle biopsy, as you see. She's had respiratory difficulty with repeated pneumonias requiring tracheotomy and has some mild pectus excavatum deformity. Uh, on examination, uh, the findings are really essentially as you see them displayed. Uh, in addition, there's diffuse weakness, a little more proximally. And the cranial nerves are very strikingly involved with facial weakness and weakness of the extraocular muscles, which is, is quite specific, we think, for this disorder as opposed to some of the other congenital myopathies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is an EEG, uh, which is uh, diffusely slow for her age. And we have some features that suggest that in addition to the muscle disorder, there is an inherited abnormality of the central nervous system. Next slide, please. Here's a normal transverse section, a normal bi biopsy. Notice the muscle fibers with uh, one to four nuclei, dark small nuclei located in the, in the subsarcolemmal position. Uh, next slide. And here's a muscle biopsy from uh, Charlotte. Notice that the nuclei in almost all the muscle fibers are centrally no located. Uh, in some, there are more than one nucleus. Here, there's one, two, and a third one, just in a little different plane. Occasionally, a fiber that appears almost normal is present with the nuclei in proper position, but certainly well over 95% of these are abnormal. There is a, a greater amount of endomycial uh, connective tissue that we see here. And in appearance, uh, I think you'll see similar to what I described for the 10-month uh, fetal uh, level, the uh, myotubular stage of muscle fiber development. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is a transverse section showing that these are uh, nuclei are intracellular and located in chains in a, almost a boxcar-like appearance. And that although the nuclei differ from fiber to fiber, within each fiber the nuclei appear to be uh, somewhat similar in staining characteristics and configuration. Notice this chain of nuclei down here. Uh, next slide. Uh, a higher power of oil uh, immersion, a picture of a single muscle fiber showing the center of this fiber just packed with uh, nuclei, maybe 12 or 15 nuclei in the center of that fiber. Next slide. And a histochemical demonstration by Dr. Coleman. Uh, we're able to see that there is increased staining of oxidative enzymes about the nuclei. Uh, the, the darkness that we see here is not the nucleus. The nucleus does not stain or stains negatively and is located here. There's a nucleus and there's another one and there's one. And this is between the nuclei where there's an increased uh, oxidative enzyme activity. Here's a nucleus here and here, and this is between the nuclei. Uh, next slide. Uh, here another section showing this uh, uh, increased uh, oxidative enzyme activity about the nuclei. Next slide. Uh, another showing the same thing. Uh, I think that's the last slide. So here we have, uh, again, I hate to use the term experiment of nature, but this is indeed uh, what this may be. And, uh, certainly is a most a fascinating consideration that someone could uh, survive into uh, uh, childhood and possibly even adult life with a, a total muscle complement that actually represents uh, fetal muscle fibers. Thank you, Dr. Monsat. I'm sure that uh, although Dr. Momartz has not seen or even discussed uh, a number of these um, interesting experiments of nature, some of which we presented to you this morning, I think in the last two or three minutes we would be very interested to hear some of his uh, observations and possible conclusions as regards where we're going in the study of normal muscle as well as these diseases, the way they seem to be cropping up. Well, this has been quite a fascinating uh, 
overwhelming. Um, I thought at the beginning that I just did that with the pad and make a few notes. Um, there are some general viewpoints, or perhaps a um, unifying classification might be an easy thing to accomplish. Uh, it is not, and perhaps I should simply not even try to relate some of these efforts. One <coughs> uh, conclusion is obvious, however, from the description of these neural diseases, and that is that most of them seem to be complicated. That is to say, uh, there are exaggerations, or gross distortions, or gross rearrangements of the normal morphology, uh, and, and visibly correlated with disturbances in function, but the picture is not terribly simple, and a great deal of study uh, will have to be devoted to each of these cases before it makes sense. I'm very glad that the expression, uh, experiment by nature, has come up in the last few minutes, uh, because that is exactly the thought that presents itself to us. Uh, nature can do experiments which we cannot do, but most of these that have been shown today are very complicated, and in that sense, they are not very good experiments. If we look upon the diseases from our own standpoint in, in physiology and such, as uh, let nature do an experiment, it saves us work. Well, these don't uh, seem to serve particularly well for this purpose. On the contrary, they will need so much work that, um, well, you know, almost several new foundations of national institutes may have to be <laughs> found <laughs> to take care of all these muscle diseases. Right. <laughs> uh, this being so, however, uh, perhaps we should remember that not all diseases, and not all muscle diseases, have been that complicated. And there is still one that, is in, uh, that excels by its simplicity as a real beautiful example of what nature occasionally can do for us, and that is the disease on which Dr. Pearson and I have worked uh, together successfully some years ago, um, and which in all probability is McGarrett's disease, although it is hard to reconstruct, perhaps not McGarrett saw at the time. Uh, that is a, an experiment of nature, uh, beautiful in its simplicity, because all that was done was to leave out one enzyme, phosphorylase. What is meant to science, I would like to recall for you, because it was quite an experience at the time, the kind of thing one would like to have every year, except it doesn't have to present itself that often. Um, at that time, it was questioned whether phosphorylase will only break down glycogen, or whether it's also responsible for the synthesis of glycogen. Um, synthesis and breakdown of glycogen were thought to be examples of a reversible reaction, in fact, the phosphorylase reaction was the textbook example of a reversible enzyme reaction. And yet doubts arose as to whether the enzyme in reality was both ways or not. Um, the experiment the required <coughs> would be take the muscle, remove its phosphorylase, and see whether it can still synthesize glycogen. Obviously, it cannot break it down. But this experiment, unlike saying you take an animal and you remove its pituitary, could not be done, it could not be done by the experimenter. But that was just what was done by nature at that occasion. It came just at the right time, uh, so much so that two months after its publication, we had an exam question on it at Columbia. <laughs> uh, this kind of simple experiments, nature doesn't do for us every time. And uh, therefore, in most of the cases uh, that are being unearthed here, and it is amazing to see how much activity there is in this field at UCLA, most of the cases will be a much longer grind to identify. But uh, with so much effort being made, uh, let's my wish, let me wish all of my colleagues many years of successful dipping in Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, uh, I would like to suggest that this is a rather unusual program, uh, well, partly because uh, as you know, in the past, Dr. Hewitt and I have solicited uh, uh, people to give these uh, conferences, and uh, uh, to my uh, surprise and delight, uh, Dr. Pearson volunteered this one. I think, however, that uh, the results of the conference uh, more than justify his uh, statement that this is an area which uh, has been unfamiliar to many of us and which we have had a superb review of uh, this, uh, this morning. I would, uh, I'm mentioning that Dr. Pearson volunteered this in the hope that uh, some of the rest of you may be stimulated in a similar direction. I want to make one announcement. Uh, 
We are having a little innovation next time, uh, that is on February 1st, which will be the next of these conferences, in which uh, we will introduce the uh, faculty of the new dental school to these uh, conferences, and they are going to present, uh, Dr. Dean Sognes and his associates will present a program concerned with oral health and systemic disease. That's on February 1st. Do you want to say anything further, Dr. Pearson? If there are any questions, uh, we're way over time. I was hoping that would be another innovation, but it didn't work. Sorry.